Unleavened Bread Ministries presents From your hands, your feet, your side Unleavened Bread Jesus Bible Studies with David Eels Can quench my thirsting soul Pure as water made me whole Let your streams of mercy flow Oh Jesus, I trust in you Greetings, saints. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. And I have a wonderful revelation here to share with you. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, uh, let your faith enter into your people to know the great and the high calling that you have given unto us who overcome. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name. And... Uh, Yep, the name of this is Grants to Overcomers. And the beginning of it is a, a revelation to Vanessa Weeks, given on 6 4 of this 2019. And it's very interesting. She said, David, on June the 4th, 2019, I had this dream. Some of us of local UBM which, by the way, many times we have discovered is a type and a shadow of larger UBM out there, or at least some of larger UBM out there. So keep that in mind, okay? She said, some of us of local UBM were in the living room of a house, and a picnic table was in this living room. Some of us were talking casually and Barry and I were sitting next to each other with uh, Debbie Fenske to the right and a little ways away, and she was talking to us about the book we are in now in our Wednesday Bible studies, and that is The Real Good News. And this book is really about what the gospel provides for those who overcome through faith. It uh, it teaches faith and uh, rest, entering into the rest through faith and believing the promises, which are all past tense, so that we can believe them. It's not a matter of waiting on God. It's a matter of just believing what he said, because they're all past tense. And so it, it causes us to enter into the rest. She said something about the chapter we were in, and uh, she had read a few chapters ahead. She was also very excited about the deliverance the Lord is doing now. Yes, we feel like <clears throat> the deliverance that the Lord is doing for His people right now is to finish up cleaning up the bride's house so that she can move into it. We've been receiving that revelation. And, uh, of course, the bride's house represents a larger ministry, more um, responsibility, such things as that. And this that's what this is about. This revelation is about the grants that are given to the bride and the overcomers. And so um, she said uh, she was also very excited about the deliverance the Lord is doing now and saying something about spiritual warfare. Yes, do spiritual warfare, saints. There's two things that have to be done in a person's life to clean it up. Uh, get the demonic activity out, which you have authority to do right there in your home. And also, uh, the natural man, the fallen man who wars against you, the carnal man. The carnal man is the one that invites those spirits in because of rebellion. Okay, so you got to deal with the spirits through spiritual warfare, and you got to make sure your your old man is on the cross by repenting and believing the promises of God. I remember seeing uh, Joe D, who comes here to visit, sitting in a chair diagonally across from her, and he was smiling as he was talking about the book. I knew we were now receiving grants. All right, grants. Hmm. 
Well, I would say grants for those who take part in the cleaning up process and the heavenly grants will come. They will come. Receiving the grants. And then she says, I woke up and I thought of Philippians 1 and 29, especially where it says, To you it hath been granted in behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer in his behalf. There is a people who are coming to the end of a time of suffering, and they're going to receive a reward. We call them the bride. So it goes on to say here, those who, let me say, let me say also that those who suffer with Jesus in his death to self-will also reign with him through the grants. You know, Jesus was not only one who was a sacrifice, he was a demonstration of what it is to die to self and be resurrected. And if we are united with him in the likeness of his death, we shall also be of the resurrection, Romans 6 says. We want that resurrection life. It's that reigning authority that we have here on earth. Paul in Philippians 3 talked about that resurrection life, not hereafter in the physical. He was talking about it now in the spiritual. So, uh... 2 Timothy 2.11 says, Faithful is the saying, For if we died with Him, we shall also live with Him. If we endure, we shall also reign with Him. Endure what? Endure the cross. Endure the chastening. Endure uh, the wicked and all their works to crucify us, right? If we endure, we shall also reign with Him. If we shall deny him, he also will deny us. Revelation 2 and 26. And he that overcometh, and he that keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give authority over the nations. All right. Well, there are many want authority, and many attempt to use authority. But the real authority is going to be manifested in the end times in a mighty powerful way through the overcomers. Because not only have they have we all been given authority written in the Scriptures, but taking advantage of that is a matter of having a clear conscience and uh, walking with the Lord to mature in the ways of wisdom to use that authority. So the Lord says, Revelation 2.26, he that overcometh, and he that keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give authority over the nations. And that's the beast, by the way, the beast kingdom. And I thought about how a grant is a gift to be used for a specific purpose. And I searched the New Testament for the word granted and found these verses. And, you know, when... When Vanessa sent that to me, I also added the Old Testament grants because there were so many wonderful things there about our day. It was just very important. And she said, it's amazing to see all the things that the Lord is granting us now. Thank you, Father, for your grace and granting us to be delivered out of the hands of our enemies. Thank you for all the things that you are giving us. May we use all you grant us for your kingdom and glory in Jesus Christ. Amen. Yay. Amen. So, let's look at some verses concerning the grants. <laughs> I thought this was a neat revelation because, you know, the Lord speaks about the grants through the Old and the New Testament. Here's one. Luke 1, 73 through 75 says, The oath which he sware unto Abraham our father. Who, we are, by the way, sons of Abraham through faith, the Bible says, right? And the covenant that he made with uh, Abraham was not annulled by the law, which came in temporarily until the seed should come to whom the promise was due, and that was Christ and all who dwell in Christ. 
So let me read that again. The oath which he sware unto Abraham our father to grant unto us, that's us, us who are real sons of Abraham through faith, that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies should serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Notice he said, to grant unto us. There's your grant right there. He's given us victory over our enemies. To those who abide in Jesus Christ, he's given victory over our enemies because the seed that came was a seed as of one, not as of a many, and that seed is Christ. Abiding in him, you have victory over your enemies, and you are Abraham's seed according to faith. Amen. Another one, Acts 4 and 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threatenings and grant unto thy servants to speak thy word with boldness. Amen. While thou stretchest forth thy hands to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of thy holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken wherein they were gathered together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spake the word of God with boldness. See, and all this was granted. They prayed, and God granted this. We need that, this in these days, right? And also Acts 14 and 2, another grant. But the Jews that were disobedient stirred up the souls of the Gentiles and made them evil affected against the brethren. Long time, therefore, they tarried there, speaking boldly in the Lord, who bear witness unto the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So, you know, when you're going out to share the gospel in the days ahead, God's going to confirm it with signs and wonders. He's going to grant signs and wonders to His overcomer people. And uh, even though uh, the enemy, the apostates, rose up against them, they prayed to God and He granted them these signs and wonders. Hard to argue with signs and wonders, really. The foolish um, in Jesus' day and the apostles' day uh, uh, spoke as though they were from Satan, for goodness sake. And they still do it today because they don't know God and they don't know His Word. So nothing's really changed. But we can pray and God will grant the signs and wonders to be done by our hands. Acts 27, uh, 23 through 25. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, whose I am and whose also I serve, and whom also I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must stand before Caesar. And lo, God hath granted thee all them that sail with thee. We've received this before uh, for the body. He's granted us all them that sail with thee. Therefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it will be even as it hath been spoken unto me. The Lord is able to grant those who sail with you. All right. I would say God speaks that to you. He spoke it to us one time, and, or several times, and uh, it was to grant the elect. To, uh, to sail with us, right? Grant those that are chosen. And also, uh, Romans 15 and 5 says, Now the God of patience and of comfort grant you to be of the same mind one with another according to Christ Jesus that with one accord you may with one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's just wonderful. And, uh, you know, the, the unity is going to be powerful in the days ahead. It ain't going to have anything to do with man's unity of denominationalism. 
uh, it's going to have to do with the unity of the Holy Spirit making us one, to be one body to fight this battle and to bring in the harvest. And that is granted by God, right, this unity. And uh, Galatians three sixteen through 18. Now to Abraham were the promises spoken, and to his seed, there it is again, he saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And of course, and uh, those who abide in Christ, who are sons of Abraham by faith, is who he's talking about. Because you don't have anything outside of Christ. It's in Christ where all of the benefits are. Abiding in Him, you bear fruit, and He picks the fruit. And if you don't abide in Him, He breaks off the limb, right? And throws in the fire. Now this I say, a covenant confirmed beforehand by God, the law which came 430 years after, doth not disannul. And, and you could say annul there, because their idea of disannul was meant today annul, right? It doesn't annul. The law did not annul the covenant made to Abraham, which is granted to Christ and all those in Christ, so as to make the promise of none effect. See, the law didn't make uh, the promise of Abraham to none effect. It's still with us when we walk by faith. It is the law uh, that has come to no effect. They don't understand that. The Bible goes on in, in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 to say that those that follow the law are blinded. They have a veil on their eyes. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no more of promise, but God hath granted it to Abraham by promise. So you have this promise in Abraham. You are sons of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ. In Ephesians three sixteen through 19 says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory that you may be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inward man. This was a prayer of Paul. And you know when Paul prays a prayer, it's not a stupid prayer. It's one that God will answer. <laughs> when a, a prayer is given in the scriptures, it's one that God will answer, right? Um, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. To the end that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be strong to apprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ. So he's talking about what is the breadth, length, height, and depth of Christ. You see? You look at the sentence carefully. So that he may be strong, that you may be strong to apprehend with all the saints or sanctified ones. You know, I got to say, not everybody's sanctified. Not everybody is separated from sin. Not everybody um, walks after the Spirit rather than after the flesh. But it's strong to apprehend with all the sanctified ones what is the breadth, length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, so that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. So this grant is to bring us to the fullness of God. And in these days, saints, you're going to see people walking as the first disciples walked after the first word given. And uh, the apostates are walking after their own word given and ignoring the word of God. And they, like the Pharisees, will have no power. They can just look on and watch the power of God's people, God's holy, sanctified people. Amen? Seeing that his divine power hath granted unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that called us by his own glory and virtue, 
whereby he hath granted unto us, there it is again, he hath granted unto us his precious and exceeding great promises, that through these you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world by lust. Notice what this grant leads to. Godliness, power, escaping the corruption, partaking of the divine nature. Wow, powerful grant. All of these are powerful grants from the Lord. It's all by grace and through faith, right? Me. Okay, let's go to some Old Testament grants here. First Chronicles 4 and 10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my border. Many call this the prayer of Jabez. And they pray it, and of course God answers. Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my border. That's kind of like the larger house we've been talking about. And that thy hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, and that it be not to my sorrow. And God granted him that which he requested. Good prayer. Good prayer. The prayer of Jabez. Good prayer for you. Right, and Second uh, Chronicles, one eleven, and God said to Solomon, "Because this was in thy heart, and thou hast not asked riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of them that hate thee, neither hast asked long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, that thou mayest judge my people." over whom I have made thee king. Because he asked in this way and did not ask in a negative way, God said, Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee, and I will give thee riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee, neither shall there be any after thee or have the like. Hmm. Interesting. So he asked for important things, and because he asked for important things, God gave him the other things he didn't even ask for. Praise God. And it was granted unto him. Oh, thank you, Father. Do that for us, Lord. We ask for wisdom and knowledge. All right. Ezra 3 and 6 uh, and 7 says, From the first day... Of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. They gave money also unto the masons, the carpenters, and food and drink and oil, unto them of Sidon and to them of Tyre, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea, unto Joppa according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. Wow. So you know Trump as uh, Cyrus is conquering Babylon and freeing the Christians and granting them expenses to build the true temple. I know some people are thinking, that this is a temple in the Middle East. But it is the temple of God. And if they do build a temple in the Middle East, that's just a type and a shadow of it. But it can't be Ezekiel's temple, which no one uncircumcised in heart could enter into. Do you understand that? How are we circumcised in heart? That's right, by repenting and receiving the gospel and the born-again experience, right? So there you have a grant to build the temple. Now, that's where we are right now. In fact, this is confirmed in other verses that are about this granting. You'd be surprised 
that I picked out. I, you think I picked and chose these verses, but it was one right after another. Uh, okay, listen to Ezra 7 and 6. And this Ezra went up from Babylon. That's the people of the captivity, right? And he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him all his request. <clears throat> hmm. According to the hand of the Lord his God, which was upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanim, unto Jerusalem, in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. Okay, that's... 6 through 8. Now here's 13. I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and their priests and the Levites in my realm that are minded of their own free will to go to Jerusalem go with thee. And uh, 15. And to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. And all the silver and gold that thou shalt find in all the province of Babylon with the free will offering of the people and of the priests, offering willingly for the house of their God which is in Jerusalem. Wow, so that's a pretty good grant. And it's just as above text I shared. Ezra was granted to lead the people of God out of Babylonish bondage with a grant from the king to build a temple of God, which is a type of God's people. Yes, we're not looking at a building in the Middle East. If they build that building... It is not Ezekiel's temple. And by the way, it, as they say, the Antichrist enters into the temple. Well, I know they don't understand that text, but it's true. And so that's not a holy temple. Right? This holy temple he can't enter into. Esther 5 and 8. And if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition, another very, very important grant, and to perform my request. Let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king has said. Wow. So Esther the bride was granted to save the people of God from the deep state beast kingdom <laughs> and bring them to their spiritual Red Sea, right? Yeah, that's what's happening. And guess who's doing it? Yep, the people of God. Mm -hmm. It's been granted. You better do the prayer and the warfare. It's been granted. And the, the Esther has given the authority, was given the authority by the king and passed it on to the people. In uh, Nehemiah uh, 2 and 7, Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come unto Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the castle, which appertaineth to the house, that's the house of God, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So again, a grant from the king to rebuild the true temple of God. Pretty neat, huh? These grants are amazing, you know. Esther 5 and 6. 
And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? He was asking the bride to bring her request, her petition. It would be granted. Hmm. Even to the half of the kingdom it shall be performed. So, bride, you need to ask whatever is needed. Jesus said it too, Mark 11 and 24. And not only that, the half of the kingdom. These people have manifested joint heirs with Christ, who is the king. Joint heirs. Joint heirs is the queen sitting next to the king, right? She's a joint heir. Oh, boy. And Esther 7 and 2. And the king said again unto Esther on the second day of the banquet of wine, what is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. There it is, granted. What is thy request? See, all this is a type and a shadow of the end time of the bride, of our king, and of the beast being conquered. And what is thy request? I think the Lord's saying that to you out there who are the bride today. What is your request? What are you waiting for? <laughs> she delayed even. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't get it out the first time, right? Even to the half of the kingdom it shall be performed. So the bride is granted to be a joint heir with Christ. And Esther 8.11, another important grant. Wherein the king granted the Jews that were in every city to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people, which is the beast, and the province that would assault them, their little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Well, the bride is granted to give authority to the people to destroy the deep state beast kingdom spread throughout the world now, by the way. Yes, start praying, start exercising your faith, start protecting the informers. Do that because we, in the last couple of days, 10 of them have been killed by, yep, you know who. <laughs> Esther 9 and 12. And the king said unto Esther the queen, The Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men in Shushan the palace. Well, it could be Washington, D.C. <laughs> and the ten sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is thy petition? And it shall be granted unto thee. Or what is thy request further? And it shall be done. Then said Esther, If it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews that are in Shushan to do tomorrow also according unto this day's decree. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. Yep, they're catching a whole bunch of them. And the bride is granted to give authority to destroy the deep state beast kingdom. All right. Job 10 and 12. Thou hast granted me life and loving kindness. And thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. You know, I like the word visitation. It's used often in the Bible about a coming of the Lord, of his visitation to the people. And we've got just such a visitation about to happen in the man-child ministry, the reformer ministry that's coming to, that is actually here, uh, but about to be uh, anointed with a higher anointing as Jesus went when he was 30 years old. Uh, even though Jesus uh, uh, and Joseph and David and people like that served the king 
as man childs before that anointing. Uh, that anointing is a special anointing to begin the tribulation things. And uh, But it's been granted life and loving kindness. And thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. Proverbs 10 and 24 says, The fear of the wicked, it shall come upon him. Well, nothing granted to them here, right? The fear of the wicked, it shall come upon him, and the desire of the righteous shall be granted. The desire of the righteous shall be granted. Why did Jesus give such all-encompassing promises like Mark 11 and 24? All things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. That's not something that a foolish man can take a hold of or even use. The foolish among God's people don't believe that verse. And they can't use it because they don't have any faith and they don't know what faith is. So it's not dangerous to put that out there. <laughs> it's, it's put out for the righteous who understand faith, who, are, who whose heart does not condemn them, so they have boldness towards God, right? So it's put out there for the righteous. All those all-encompassing promises are put out there for the righteous. They're the only ones you can trust with power. Other people try to exercise these things, and because they don't draw cl close to the Lord and their heart does condemn them, they're not able to accomplish what's given there. It's granted. The desire of the righteous shall be granted. Shall be granted. And when the whirlwind passeth, the wicked is no more. But the righteous is an everlasting foundation. That's because it's the foundation of the temple, right? The righteous is an everlasting foundation. Yes, the whirlwind is coming. Plagues are coming. Explosions are coming. Uh, hordes of people killing is coming. Um, the destroying of the crops and so on and so forth, it's coming. It's happening and it's coming. Yes, we're at the verge of uh, a lot of destruction. And the people of God who have faith will be preserved. Those who don't have time to study the Word of God, all they need is an hour on Sunday. Uh, they'll go home with nothing. Psalm 20 and 4. Grant thee thy heart's desire and fulfill all thy Counsel, Isn't that awesome? Grant thee. He's, of course, talking to the righteous, not the wicked. And Psalm 119 and 29. Remove from me the way of falsehood, and grant me thy law graciously. See, there's so many of God's people that don't understand the Word, and the Word is not affecting them. Uh, and they don't spend enough time in it so that the Word can go in and transform their lives, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to put, you have to love the Word enough to spend enough time in the Word to have it transforming the way you think and the way you speak, because this is where power comes from. If a person doesn't think and speak right, they can't use power. Okay. And grant me thy law graciously. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. Thine ordinances have I set before me. I cleave unto thy testimonies. O Lord, put me not to shame. I will run the way, I like this, I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. You see, friends, it's all by grace. When God enlarges your heart, you'll be able to run the way of His commandments. If you're failing to keep His commandments, and maybe just making up doctrines that make you acceptable right there, when you're not an overcomer, and there's no promise to those that don't overcome by keeping the commandments, uh, then you're not in this way. 
I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. This is this proves a trust in the Lord to put in us that which is not naturally there. I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. You know we need to pray uh, Psalm 119. There is so much in Psalm 119 that speaks of God's grace being given to His people to be what they need to be and to be what they could not be by on their own. It speaks so much about grace. Go and read it. I, I challenge you to mark down the verses that speak of God giving everything to you and all of your needs, all of your wants. He even puts those in your heart. He works in us to will and to do of His good pleasure, right? <clears throat> Amen. Now, this is a, a strange grant in Psalm 140, 7 through 11, but it is true. O Lord, the Lord, strength of my salvation, Thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. Yes, we need a covering. Uh, you know, the helmet of salvation represents the knowledge that you've already been saved by the Lord. You've been delivered from the very beginning. A lot of people don't know that. They don't put on the helmet and they get their head smashed in. Right? Now, here it is. Verse 8. Grant not. <laughs> Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Further, not his evil device, lest they exalt themselves. Grant not the desires of the wicked or their wicked devices, lest they exalt themselves. <clears throat> well, we see many wicked devices going forth now um, from the wicked at this time, both in the government uh, and uh, those support the deep state government, and uh, also uh, the factious in the church. M many evil devices. And here's a, a good word. Grant not the desires of the wicked. Further not the, their evil devices, lest they exalt themselves. Right. So God is bringing them down so they can exalt themselves. This is a change. It's a temporary change, but it's a change, and it's needed badly at this time in order to give the saints um, most of the first three and a half years to be raised up into the body that they used to be in the days of Jesus and his apostles. Because many people are not going to survive what's coming, spiritually or physically. That's why the bride in Esther was giving authority to the people that they didn't have, that they didn't know they had. The people of God don't know they've got it. they just biting their fingernails, you know. And when things come, they just say, oh, well, you know, they don't have any authority. They don't do anything to stop it. Here's, here's a prayer that will stop it right here. Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Further not his evil device lest they exalt themselves. Amen. As for the head of those that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. Amen, Lord. So be it. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits, whence they shall not rise. An evil speaker shall not be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. Amen. Absolutely true. Saints, um, we need to walk in the Spirit of God. We need grace. We need to ask God for that grace. Um if we will 
receive these grants, we will be a powerful people. And the overcomers in the days to come, you can read about them in the letters to the churches in the book of Revelation. He didn't make any promises to people that weren't overcoming. But i got to tell you, the gospel shows people how to overcome. It's the really, really good news of what was given to us freely by the Lord. And when a person doesn't have faith for these things, uh, they can't overcome. And so we get faith. It cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word. And that's how we overcome. Spend time in the Word of God. Spend time in repentance. Spend time in doing spiritual warfare against your enemies. Be sure and clean up your house. Be sure and get the the household together and y'all do some deliverances and uh, speak against those uh, evil spirits that are ruling in your lives and in your homes and in your local bodies and so on. Be sure and uh, draw near to God and draw near to the Lord Jesus. Believe the promises of God. Enter into His rest through faith in the promises of God. And these grants, of course, they are promises of God. Having therefore these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you for your mighty signs and wonders and miracles too, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for building your temple. Thank you for delivering your people out of Babylonish bondage. Thank you for bringing about this administration that is now spreading throughout the earth to overcome the one world order, which attempted a little bit too early to bring down the people of God. And so it will take them a while to catch back up for the tribulation period, but by the time the middle of the trib comes, they will be in full force and they will make war on the saints again. And this time, many, many will die. I'm not saying that many won't die now because I do know that the Lord keeps telling us over and over in our morning prayer meeting, He keeps telling us that He is bringing judgment against the apostate church that rules over the people of God. Why? Because they would not follow the man-child into the wilderness if he did not destroy this wicked thing that they call a church over the people of God. It must be brought down, and it will be brought down, and God's going to use the deep state to do that, but that's also going to be the, the end of the deep state. I mean, it's going to be toppled. And Father, we thank you for that. We're praying for that. We're praying that you give uh, grace uh, to the Trump administration and the administrations that are being raised up in Europe and Scandinavia and places like that where uh, the leadership had given their countries over to the beast kingdom, the Islam beast kingdom. And now the Lord is going to have mercy and grace on much over there, even though there is a great lack of Christianity there. But they're seeing here what Christianity is doing. They're seeing a miracle. And if they can't see a miracle, they're blind as bats because nobody could do this. How many presidents has the deep state killed who came against them? Hmm. One day we'll know. But I can think of quite a few. So, Lord, we we thank you that you have made uh, this man to stand strong. We ask you to give him strength and wisdom. We ask you also to give strength and wisdom to uh, the people who serve him. I don't say that they're Christians, and I don't say that he is one either, but I do say Uh, that he favors the Christians, and that is kind of uh, a thing that Cyrus did, by the way, when he came in to conquer the last king of Babylon, who, by the way, was trying to uh, force 
his God upon Babylon, and they didn't like it. And Cyrus came in to give uh, a freedom of religion and to uh, overthrow the thing that the king of Babylon was doing. And it made him, uh, it gave him quite a lot of favor before the people. So this is happening. It's just history repeating. The things that have been are the things that shall be, and the things that have been done are the things that shall be done. There's no new thing under the sun. This is our God. He is doing a mighty, mighty miracle before the tribulation in order to give some kind of relative peace. I'm not talking about peace from nature. <laughs> That's not true. Um, but some relative peace from the powers that be um, in order for the church to get its stuff together and uh, listen to the reformers and become the church that they were called to be. Without that, we're not going to affect this earth, and the harvest will be small. But this is going to happen. God is raising His people up. He's empowering them. He's giving them these grants to rebuild the true temple, the true temple of God. You can't look out there at the church and say that that's the true temple of God. Because it doesn't even look like Jesus Christ. It doesn't emulate Jesus Christ. It emulates their modern-day pastors. And it's pitiful and powerless and evil. And God is going to destroy it. Thank God. Oh, let me say that the Pharisees and Sadducees will follow us all the way up until the end. But there are key people who are controlling key people that God wants set free, and He's going to do it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your awesome miracle that you're doing for your people in delivering them from this evil time to come. Even though it's a short time, uh, it's like uh, uh, Sister Sue um Gilbert had a dream that President Trump was handing out timepieces, you know, clocks, timepieces, watches, whatever, I guess. And, uh, and what, it was, what it represented, he's given us a little time. He's giving us a little time. And by the way, there's a lot of so-called Christians out there um, slamming him because of his non-Christian ways and thinkings and because he is, uh, by the way, making um, opportunity for this digital system to come in, which is, of course, the foundation for the mark of the beast. Listen, God is the one who is bringing the mark of the beast. Don't think you can do away with it. Don't think that the people that bring it either are bad necessarily. Uh, let me say, if you go back to Daniel nine twenty six and twenty seven, you will find it's not a man that is the antichrist. It's a principality, just like all the other princes there. Michael was a prince, by the way, prince of Greece, prince of Persia, principality. What prince is coming back? The prince of the Roman Empire is coming to make the beast kingdom and to make the mark of the beast. And so because look at it. I mean it happened back in that day and that same person is doing it in this day. So he's not we're not talking about um thousands a year old person here. So I mean we just uh, you have to have some common sense here. So yes, you can't stop the mark of the beast. God ordained the mark of the beast to separate the wheat from the tares. It is going to happen. It is going to come. But He has been given to give us a little time before it does come. But it will come. It has to come. It has to come to separate the wheat from the tares. The tares don't have any faith. They stand in churches all the time, all over the world. And they need to be separated. And God's going to do it. They've got no faith to live in the wilderness. 
All right. God bless you, saints. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope this has helped you, and I hope you will take advantage of the text we're going to post so that you can, you know, think on these grants and act on these grants and pray on these grants. They are promises of God, right? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right. God bless you, and good night. Oh, by the way, uh, Michael Hare is going to come. I want to bless him too. But Father, in the name of Jesus, would you bless Michael Hare uh, and the brethren that are listening to him, uh, that the mighty move of your spirit will work through him and through them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you. Bless you. Bye. Well, thank you, Brother David, and God bless you. Hello, saints. Good to be back with you again. Got kind of a cloudy day out there today, but that's okay. It's it's nice and warm. Let's go to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in your people. You're getting them cleaned up. You're getting them ready to go, Lord. And that's that's, that's what's necessary for the times that we're in, Lord. And I thank you that uh, you are cleaning us up. You've got us on that holy road. And uh, you're going to keep us there because our faith is going to be awesome in the times ahead because you've given us that faith. And we're believing it. And we thank you for it, Father. Because everything that we do is by faith, Lord. Everything that we have. And you give us the faith to believe that we are walking this holy life. And we just praise you, Father. In Jesus' name. Well, I'd like to talk about a new bride is chosen. You know, when you study the relationship between the man-child and the bride, what you come to find out is that the man-child is a part of the bride company. Because as David dwelt in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem represents the bride according to Revelation, He was a part of that. But he was also the head. He was the leadership of the bride, the capital city, which in turn was the leadership over the rest of the 12 tribes. And when you study the book of Esther, we discover some things that differentiate the bride from the rest of the people, from the many virgins that had come to be inspected by the king in making that great decision as to who the true bride was going to be. And we learn that everything the bride desired was given to her. It tells us that in Esther 2 and 13. Uh, It was given to her so that she could go into the king's house. And it's interesting to realize that God has already provided everything we need to be beautiful in his sight as his bride, to come into his presence. And since everything has already been given, whose fault is it if we don't partake of it? It ain't God's. Some people are are spending all their time trying to talk God into something, and the Bible said he's already given it to us. So it's up to us to believe it and to accept it and to walk by faith. Well, let's look at what it is to be a member of this bridal body, okay? Esther chapter 2 and verse 15 says, Now, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed Now, you see here, she required nothing but what Haggai had appointed. He was the king's chamberlain, and he represents in this parable the Holy Spirit. Everything we need comes from him. We don't need anything from man whatsoever. We don't need nothing from man. In fact, it's a waste of time. The Bible says that we don't even have need for any man to teach us, that we have an anointing from the Holy One. 1 John 2.27, it says, And as for you, the anointing which you received of him abideth in you. And you need not that anyone teach you, but as his anointing teaches you concerning all things, 
and is true, and is no lie, and even as it taught you, ye abide in him. But however, the Holy One uses men to teach us, and to preach, and to lead, and to guide, but he has to be in it. We have no need for men to do this. We have to make sure that we're receiving from the Lord. Romans 8 and 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And notice that in verse 15, the name of Esther's father is mentioned. Whereas before it was only mentioned that Mordecai's uncle was Esther's father. And after speaking of all the qualities of purification of the seven maidens, of the things that were given unto her out of the king's house, now it speaks of her being the daughter of Abihel. You know what that means? It means the father of might, or in other terms, almighty father. Now it's mentioned that she is an offspring of the almighty, praise be to God. And she required nothing but what the Holy Spirit appointed. Isn't that the way it's supposed to be with us? We don't need nothing else but what the Holy Spirit has given to bring us to this point. And he's provided it, everything. He's provided everything. And the first thing that comes to mind when we read this verse is the word of God, which was spoken by the Holy Spirit in 2 Timothy. The Holy Spirit uses the word of God to dress us up, to make us beautiful before the king. And if you're expecting to do so in any other way, you'll find that the word itself says that ain't going to happen. Second Timothy 3 and 14 says, But abide thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Listen, folks. There's a lot of people in this world we can't trust to teach us. And frankly, in our immature state, in some cases, we don't really need to know that. We've become very respectful of men who are not in obedience to the Holy Spirit, nor have they even learned of the Holy Spirit, nor are they vessels through whom the Holy Spirit speaks. But we know of whom we have learned these things from the Scriptures. For instance, we know the people whom God used. We know the Apostle Paul, don't we? We know Peter. We know John. We know the people whom God used as our teachers. And we know that the Scripture tells us to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints in Jude 1 and 3. We're not supposed to trust in any different faith today, but the one which was once and for all delivered unto the saints in 1 John 2.24. If that which you heard from the beginning, who is that? That's Paul, Peter, John, etc., all by the Holy Spirit. Abide in you, ye also shall abide in the Son and in the Father. There ain't no way to bear fruit and be beautiful except to abide in the Son. And so he says, You know from whom you've learned this, and we know from Bible numerics also. These ancient men didn't write this on their own. It was the Holy Spirit who wrote this. Every jot, every tittle, it says, every letter is in its place in the original Greek and Hebrew. These men were totally, perfectly inspired to do this, And no other writing on the face of the earth is that way. And we know now, even better than they knew in that day, that God Almighty was using these men. And that's the only way you can trust a man. We can trust the teachers in the scriptures, but you can't trust an awful lot of other people. That's why we need to check everything out against the Word of God. And that's the problem. A lot of people don't read the Word of God. Salvation is the thing that makes us beautiful. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 says, And that from a babe thou hast known the sacred writings which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You know, salvation to some people is, uh, Well, I accepted Jesus. I stuck my toe in the door. Now all I got to do is sit down and wait for the rapture. <laughs> 
That's the way they think. But I'm going to tell you what the truth is. And it's this, that salvation is the full manifestation of Christ in you. Salvation is salvation in your spirit, in your soul, in your mind, will, and emotions. It is the manifestation of Christ in you. And that's what's beautiful. Because as Jesus himself said, no one hath ascended into heaven but he that descended out of heaven, John 3 and 13. Folks, Jesus himself is coming down to live in his saints. He's our fruit. There's some people out there that say the word of God is not the most important thing. It's the fruit. Well, where does the fruit come from? It comes from the word of God. When the sower went forth and sowed the seed, which was the word of God in the hearts, it brought forth fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold, it tells us in Matthew 13. Everything comes through faith in the Word. <coughs> Excuse me, he's not leaving faith out here. We just read it. He says, Wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And so it's faith in the Word. That's the foundation, every need being met, and it all comes from the Holy Spirit. Just like we read in our text in Esther. We don't need anything to be beautiful for the Lord more than what he has already done by his Holy Spirit and by the faith that he puts in our heart. Second Timothy 3 and 16. Every scripture inspired of God. Actually, that phrase ought to be translated God breathed. Because the root word for breathe there is the same as the root word for spirit as in Holy Spirit is also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. Now, this is what we're talking about here. What is it to be in the bride? We're talking about being complete in the Lord. Some people say, hey, that ain't possible. Well, then that's a, a ludicrous statement Paul is making to Timothy. And that the Holy Spirit is making to us saying that the man of God may be complete. That that word uh, complete there is the same word for perfect. You know that? Verse 17, that the man of God may be complete or perfect, furnished completely unto every good work. And if you'll notice that it's unto every good work, it's important to have works, folks. The bride is beautiful because she's dressed up by the Holy Spirit to do good works. She's dressed up by the Word of God to do the works of God. And we know that these promises through the Word are all we need for sanctification. The Bible says, Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. And that's the bride right there. In the fear of God, it says in 2 Corinthians 71. Folks, it all comes by faith in the Word. We can, all of us, be totally, perfectly cleansed according to the Word of God. And if you don't have faith, and you're taught not to have faith, then you can't have it. And you ain't going to be in the bride. Jesus said, according to your faith, be it done unto you in Matthew 9 and 21, or 29. Then in Matthew 8 and 13, it says, As thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Many of you out there know that it's real important what you believe. Now, we're not talking about our power to be holy. We're talking about God's power to be holy. That's ours because of our faith. So it's real important that we believe exactly what the Word of God has to say without adding to it or taking away from it. And again, if, if you'll notice, it was the Holy Spirit who brought these things. And that's all we need. Just that it's, as it said of Esther, we need nothing except what the king's chamberlain provides. There ain't nothing that man has to offer that's going to make us that much closer to God. Revelation 22 and 18 says this, I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto them, listen, we don't need nothing but what the Holy Spirit has provided. 
You don't need a Sunday school book. What you need is the book. You need to get it first hand, not second hand or third or fourth or fifth hand. And you don't need to trust in any pastor or anything else as far as that goes. You need to go right to the Word of God. That's the most important thing you can do because the Word of God is the seed. That's the sperma, which is the Greek word for seed. That's the sperma of God himself that will recreate the Son of God in you. Verse 18, I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto them, God shall add unto him the plagues which are written in this book. Listen, God don't want his seed polluted by men. He doesn't want us to waste our time with a lot of dead religion. That doesn't bring forth Jesus. And for that reason, a lot of people is not going to be in the bride because they've trusted man. They hadn't gone to the seed, and they hadn't sown it in their heart. Listen, God has given us a two-edged sword here in the Word of God, which is, will conquer every enemy that you got. It'll conquer Satan himself. There ain't no enemy can stand against this sword, against this weapon. But he says that you got to pick it up and you got to use it, don't you? Romans 8 and 13 says this, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. But you have to take up that sword and you got to use it, right? You can pray for God's help and he'll be with you. But he's the one by his Holy Spirit that says you need to do this. You need to take that sword up. Don't add to it. Don't pollute or dilute his word with a lot of goofy stuff that comes from people. That ain't going to help you. It's a hindrance, and he warns us that there's a curse on this. In Revelation 22 and 18 again, I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto them, God shall add unto him the plagues which are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of the, this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and out of the holy city. Listen, you definitely wouldn't be part of the bride that way. The holy city is the bride. And it goes on and says, which are written in this book. We want to make sure that we're not impressed with men's rules and men's regulation, men's thinkings and all of their silly ideas. All these things that pollute what the king's chamberlain gives because nothing but what he gives is going to empower us to be in the bride. There's a strict warning over in Galatians chapter 4 and 5. And many people like to add their thoughts, their rules, and all their little old stupid regulation. And it's called putting God's people under the law. Whether it's the law of the Old Testament or the law of man, or the law of religion. If you can't find it in the New Testament, you ought to throw it out because you don't need nothing but what the Holy Spirit is giving, right? And we don't want to add things that make us feel self-righteous because we've done whatever it is that they've told us to do. Paul speaks about the manifestation of sonship in God's people to a group who were in that same type of situation, Galatians 4 and 19. My little children, of whom I am again in travail until Christ be formed in you. How could they have lost the manifestation of Christ in them? Well, they did it by seeking to be justified by the law. Even though, obviously the new covenant means that the first one passed away, right? It's a new covenant. It ain't the old one. It's the new one. And this is exactly what the book of Hebrews says. And what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says that if, if we don't know it, it's because we've got a blinder over our eyes. And when ministers add the old covenant to the new covenant, and if we don't know that the old covenant has passed away, then we let those people drag us back under the old covenant rules and regulation that make us feel justified. But in the new covenant, the letter of the Old Covenant separates us from Christ. And if we're separated from Christ, 
you definitely ain't going to be in the bride or the man-child ministry. Galatians 5 and 3 say, Yea, I testify again to every man that receives circumcision that he is a debtor to do the whole law. So you can see here that if your ministers or your religion puts you under any part of the law, you got to keep the whole law. That's the bad part about it. Then verse 4 says, Ye are severed from Christ, ye who would be justified by the law. You are fallen away from grace. And you're also told in chapter 4 that not only are you severed from Christ and fallen away from grace, but you're not in the bride. You're in the handmaid. It says in uh, chapter 4 and verse 21, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Now listen, I want to tell you again that the law of the Old Testament is a covenant that God did not make with us. God never made the Old Covenant with us. You don't have to figure out what part you're under because he refused to make that with the Gentiles, didn't he? Psalms 147 and 19, he says, He shows his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his ordinances unto Israel. He hath not dwelt, dealt so with any nation. And as for his ordinances, they have not known him. He didn't do so with any other nation but Israel. So we need to find out what's in the New Testament. Don't add to it with any other covenant that God didn't make with us, right? Galatians 4.22 says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the handmaid and one by the free woman. Howbeit the son by the handmaid is born after the flesh, but the son by the free woman is born through promise, which things contain an allegory. For these women are two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, bearing children unto bondage, which is Hagar. Now, if you'll notice, the handmaid is rep representing those that desire to be under the law, to be justified by the law. And those who have to keep the whole law in order to do it. Now, verse 25. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to the Jerusalem that now is, for she is in bondage with her children. It, it, listen, folks, if you go under the law, it don't make any difference if you are perfect. Uh, and you keep all the laws as a perfect Jew, you're still a son of the handmaid. That's what the Word of God just got through saying. Verse 26, but the Jerusalem that is above is free, which is our mother. Now, he's talking about the new Jerusalem that's being born from above. We're born out of heaven, folks. John 3, 3 says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except one be born anew or from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is our mother. And what is that? That's the wife. This is the bride we're talking about right here. Galatians 4 and 27. For it is written, Rejoice thou, barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For more are the children of the desolate than of her that hath the husband. Man, and that's so true. There are more people that are under the law, either the law of religion or the law of the old covenant or man's law, then there's going to be in the bride. Verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Isaac was born of the bride. He was the fruit of the bride, and the bride can't be under any part of the law and still be the bride. Verse 29. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, so also is, is now. How be it what saith the scriptures? Cast out the handmaid and her son, for the son of the handmaid shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Folks, the son of the free woman is the bride. The other is a concubine. You can see the difference there, can't you? A much higher position of authority and rank belongs to the bride. Just like Sarah was over Hagar. Abraham told Sarah what he tell her. He said, she's in your hand. Do whatever you want to with her. And that's the way it was. And that's the way it's still going to be. 
Wherefore, brethren, we are not children of a handmaid, but of a, the free woman. So it's real important. If you're going to be in the bride, to be free from all the things that are added that are not the Holy Spirit. The parable is clearly telling us that we don't need nothing else. Now, listen, I don't go to say that the old covenant isn't valuable. It really is. It's valuable, not as a covenant, but as a parable, as a type and a shadow. But unless we translate those things as the apostles did, and as Jesus did when they brought them into the new covenant, they don't have any real value because the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Second Corinthians 3 and 6. Listen, nice stories are fine, but to see the parable that the story is making, the real point that it's making, that's what's important. Because what was written naturally to the natural Jews is written spiritually to the spiritual Jew. Amen. First Corinthians 10 and 11 says, Now these things happened unto them by way of example, <clears throat> and they were written for our admonition. These are for types and shadows, upon whom the ends of the ages are come. So if we want to be in the bride, we can't be under the law of men or under a law of a covenant that don't exist and was never made for us. And that's real important. Since the Holy Spirit takes the New Testament to dress us up with the works of a disciple of Christ, it's real important that we walk in the works of our new covenant and that we don't get under a law seeking to be justified. Now, here's another detail about the bride. Well, here's something else about the bride. Revelation 19 and 8. And it was given unto her that she should array herself in fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, we just saw in Galatians chapter 4 and 5 that the acts of the law are no longer righteous, the righteous acts of the saints. First of all, you're rebelling against the covenant of God gave to you in order to keep a covenant God didn't give to you. So basically, you don't have a covenant in that case. He's telling us here that the bride has become ready because she has arrayed herself in fine linen, bright and pure. Now that Greek word used for bright there is lampros. That linen is not just white, it's lampros bright. It shines like a lamp. She had to be dressed up with a wedding garment and her wedding attire was this lamp rose garment. Then we're told about others that are invited to the marriage ceremony and the marriage supper. Revelation 19 and 9, he saith unto me, right, blessed are they that are bidden to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, that ain't talking about the bride. The word bidden is kaleo, or called, or invited. What kind of garment these people have on? Well, that's the army that follows the Lord on white horses. Verse 14, And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white. Here's the word lucos, white lucos, and pure. Those who are invited are not the bride. She can't be invited to her own wedding, can she? But these have a lucos garment. While the bride's got a lampros garment, which is the righteous acts of the saints. That's the garment, the lucos garment. And what determines righteous act? Well, our covenant does. What is commanded of us in our covenant, God's going to do. That's why it's called the good news. And our part is faith, believing what he says about us. And his part is fulfilling it. We don't have any power to be holy in ourselves. It has to come from God, folks. We can only be what we are, and what we are is a problem. That's our problem. So what do we do? Romans 6 and 11 says, Even so reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. And the Holy Spirit does the rest. What we do, we obey him in reckoning ourselves to be dead unto sin, 
not counting ourselves as sinners saved by grace. We're not sinners because we've been saved from sin. It says made free from sin in verse 18. If you sin, you confess it, get right back to the righteous state, reckoned by God as righteous. And if we want to be in the bride, we want to have on this bright lamprose garment because of our works being in agreement with our covenant with God. The Holy Spirit takes the word of the New Testament, dresses us up with the actions and the works of the Holy Spirit, which is the works of God. And that's what makes us beautiful to the Lord, to be dressed up with this. Now, we've got a good example in Deuteronomy 22 of what we don't want in our garment. And we need to look at these types and shadows just as that. What do they point to? Well, remember what I said in 2 Corinthians 3 and 6, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. A Jew who was under the letter of the law did not dare depart from the letter of the law when they were under that covenant. But folks, that covenant don't exist anymore. It ain't going to cover them. There's only one covenant that exists now. Jesus said this, except one be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God in John 3 and 5. And he also said, except one be born anew or from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Folks, there ain't but one way. There ain't no other covenant, and that's a false doctrine out there. In the sundry laws given to, in, to individuals, it's written in Deuteronomy 22 and 11, Thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff, wool and linen together. In other words, no polluted garment. No part kingdom and part world. What would that be? That would be works, as we just saw. That would be part works that are acceptable to God, beautiful to God, and part world. And we don't want a polluted garment. Now, wool is positive in this sense. You have a wool garment when the beast has been put to death because the wool is from the lamb, right? And that represents the child of God. We present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God in Romans 12 and 1. And then we present this old life to be crucified. And the wool here represents the life of a believer whose flesh has been crucified, been cut off, and been put to death. Now, the linen here represents something else. You know, linen is created from flax, and that's a plant that grows out of the earth. And it's not acceptable to mix that in with the wool. On the other hand, we've got another parable given among the laws, given to priests in the inner court, where different attributes of wool and linen are used. Ezekiel 44 and 17 says it. And it shall be that when they enter in at the gates of the inner court, they shall be clothed with linen garments, and no wool shall come upon them, while they minister in the gates of the inner courts and within. They shall have linen tires upon their heads, and shall have linen breeches upon their loins. They shall not gird themselves with anything that causes sweat. Now, this parable is obvious, folks. As God's New Testament priests, we can't enter into his presence if we're sweating. Because that means that man's works ain't going to be permitted to get us in his audience or favor or benefit. And also, only the white linen garment of righteous works is acceptable in his sight. Revelation 19 and 8. And it was given unto her that she should array herself in fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And we see here his works in us. It ain't our works. So we need to go back and study the story about Cain and Abel. Cain brought a sacrifice that grew from the earth, and his sacrifice wasn't acceptable to God. But Abel brought a lamb from his flock, flock and slaughtered it, Offering the lamb and the fat as a sacrifice to the Lord, and it pleased him. What did that represent? That represented our crucified life. 
There's some people out there right now that say, wait a minute, Jesus is the only sacrifice. Yeah, but Jesus sacrificed his life so that we could sacrifice our life. And some say it was so that we wouldn't lose our life. That Well, that's, that's true. We don't want to lose our spiritual life, but our carnal life, we've got to lose. Jesus said, for whosoever would save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it, Matthew sixteen twenty five. It's the sacrifice of Jesus that enables us to give up our life because we were crucified with him. When he died, we died, right? Do you know that when Adam died, we died? In the loins of Adam were the seed of all mankind. When he died, everybody died. When Jesus died, our old man died. And when Jesus was resurrected, we were resurrected. So we claim the end from the beginning. And we thank God that it's already been done. It's already been accomplished. And because of our faith, the Holy Spirit empowers us. So we see here that we don't want to be like Cain, do we? And we don't want to add our works that come from the earth to the works that come from the crucified life. Since only the crucified life is acceptable unto the Lord. And another place here we're told about a polluted garment is in Isaiah 64 and 4. For from of old men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, Neither hath the eye seen a God besides thee who works for him that waits for him. And if you'll notice, it's talking about works here. It's, it's God's himself who worketh all things after the counsel of his will in Ephesians one eleven. In us, according to his good pleasure. Go, folks, it's God's works in us. There's people out there who say, you're not saved by work. You are saved by God's works. You're not saved by self-works. You're not saved by works of the law. You're not saved by any form of self-justification. But God puts his works in you when you walk by faith in his word. So nobody's ever known a God besides this God who works for us as we wait for him. You know what our problem is? We're real impulsive, aren't we? We've been trained all our life to just do what comes into our mind. Most of the time, we don't wait on God. We don't even consider. We don't see if it's all scriptural. We don't slow down enough to hear his voice. Isaiah 40 and 31 says, But they that wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. That's the people who's going to overcome the world, as the Bible said. That's what eagles' wings do. They overcome the world. Ain't nobody got a God like ours, do. <laughs> Verses 64 and 4 in Isaiah said, Who works for him that waits for him? Thou meetest him that rejoices and worketh righteousness. Well, amen. That's the righteous acts of the saints we're talking about. And what the bride is dressed up in, that makes her beautiful to the Lord. And goes on and says, those that remember thee in thy ways. Folks, Jesus is the way. Over in the book of Acts, the Christian movement was called the way. And that, you know what they did? That's the way in the steps of Jesus. He's the word in the New Testament. We're walking in his steps that he laid down in his commands. We got to remember the Lord's way. We wait on him. We remember his ways, and we, we remember to walk in it. Verse 5, Behold, thou was wroth, and we sinned. In them have we been of long time, and shall we be saved? They're in the works of the flesh. They're not spending time putting on the wedding garment. That beautiful, brilliant, bright garment. Verse 6, For we are all become as one that is unclean, and all our righteousnesses are as a polluted garment. All of their self-righteousness, all of their uncleanness is as filthy rags, a polluted garment. Now Jude tells us that we should be hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now a garment can be spotted by the flesh because the flesh is your works, remember? 
if your works are flesh, folks, your garment is spotted. And if your works are righteous, pure, and holy, then you've got that lampros garment, or at least a leucos garment, a white garment. Obviously, the bride has the cleanest garment, the greatest garment. That's the one that shines like a light. And since they were in their sins for a long time, their garment was a polluted garment. As Christians, folks, we have a right to walk in holiness through faith. But if we walk in our sins and not by faith, we're going to have a polluted garment. And we ain't going to be in the bride. I'm sorry, that is just not biblical. Isaiah 64 and 6 says, We all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Folks, your iniquities take you away from God, from the position that we would have as a believer in God, and one in whom the bride is manifested. Verse 7, And there is none that calls upon thy name, that stirs up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy faith from us, and hast consumed us by means of our iniquities. Jude 123 says, Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Folks, we have to hate all these little old things that spoil our garment, that keep us from being in the bride. And the most important thing, of course, is that we walk by faith, that the Lord has already delivered us from our sins, and he nailed them on that tree. He has delivered us and made us free from sin. Romans 6 and 18. Uh, and then verse 11. Even so reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Then Galatians 2 and 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And that life which I now live in the flesh, I live in faith. The faith which is in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Folks, that's the word of faith that the Apostle Paul taught us. So we have to remember that it's not by our works that we get to be in the bride. It's by his works, that his works are involved when we walk by faith in him. And we have to always remember that because otherwise we get a little bit anxious and we get troubled. And anxiety is just going to keep us from doing the works of God because anxiety is the opposite of faith. God don't want us to be anxious or even to walk under condemnation. He wants us to walk by faith in his promises so that the power of the Holy Spirit can rise up in us and cause us to be what we could never be otherwise. And this is the secret that God is revealing to disciples that love me and want to be pleasing to me. Listen, there are a lot of wonderful parables in the Old Testament. And if you slow down and think on them and you ask the Holy Spirit to reveal them to you, he's going to show you the spirit behind them. Now, here's another one that speaks about this cleansing in Leviticus 14 and 8. And he that is to be cleansed, he in his polluted garment, his polluted works, his sins, shall wash his clothes. Folks, our works are our clothes. And we wash them with the washing of the word of God, as Paul told us. And goes on and says, and shave off all his hair. How come? Why do you want to shave off the hair? Because 1 Corinthians 11 speaks of hair as a sign of submission. And in this case, it's talking about a sign of submission to the world. In Paul's case, it's talking about submission to our husband. Hair can be both positive positive and negative. And in this case, it's negative. So he'll wash his clothes and shave off all his hair, his submission to the world of the flesh, and in verse 8, and bathe himself in water, and he shall be clean. And after that, he shall come into the camp, but shall dwell outside his tent seven days. Well, what tent's he talking about? He's talking about the ultimate tent. What tent do we get after the seven days? We get the new tent. That's our new body. 
And we know that for the bride, the last seven days is the marriage feast in which the bride and the groom feast on the word, right? He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, John 3, 29 said. And who's the bridegroom? That's the man child. And according to type, the exact same thing is going to happen again. The Lord, who will be fully manifested in his man child, is going to fellowship, teach, and raise up his bride during the last seven days, which are seven years. And a day and a year are the same according to Daniel's 70th week. And after that seven days, years, we get a new body, don't we? Salvation is through spirit, soul, and body. Salvation is Christ in you, spirit, soul, and body. And we'll have a body like unto his glorious body that First John chapter 3 talks about. And Ephesians is very plain concerning the bride also. Ephesians 5.24, But as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives also be to their husbands in everything. Folks, we need to be subject to Christ in everything. And the natural is true, too, that wives need to be subject to their husbands. But we have to be subject to our husband as the church is subject to Christ. The true called out ones, which is what church means, are subject to Christ. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it that he might sanctify it. That word sanctify means separate it, to separate it from the works of the world, from the garment that's spotted by flesh. Separ- uh, sanctification is separation unto God. And going on saying, having cleansed it by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And this is what has been provided for all of us. We were sanctified at the cross. So how come the Lord is saying this as though it could happen in the future? Well, just because we were sanctified at the cross doesn't mean that we necessarily walk in it by faith, does it? First Thessalonians 4 and 3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So we see that this will be a future manifestation. What we received at the cross has to be manifested through our faith and through the cleansing of the washing of the water with the word. That's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about what we have at the cross. He's talking about manifestation. And if you'll notice that he might sanctify it, having cleansed it by the washing of the water of word, this is where we cooperate with God in order to be that spotless and blemishless bride. And he's offering this to the church here. But he, what he's saying, he, he's saying might, that he might do it. Not all the church is going to cooperate with him in this process. Some to more and some to less of an extent will it cooperate and receive what the Lord already provided for him. Amos 3 and 3 says, says this, shall two walk together except they have agreed? We need to cooperate so that he can finish this sanctifying process in us and cleanse us from the polluted garment, putting on us that righteous, beautiful garment. Is he going to be able to present the whole church to himself? No, because the Bible tells us that's not going to happen. But it's provided for. It's there for you. Ephesians 5.27, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's God's provision for us, folks, that we might be holy and without blemish. What does the Bible say for us to do to cooperate with that? Well, 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises, beloved, Let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's what the Lord provided for us. Every one of us can take advantage and have the Lord's washing of his word to cleanse our garments to be prepared for him. 
And because Esther took advantage of the fact that all she needed came from the Holy Spirit, and that's represented in type by Haggai, of course, the king's chamberlain, she didn't have anything but what was appointed of him. She didn't want anything added or taken away. As the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit knows exactly the heart of God. And so he knows how to dress us up, don't he? And that's his job, to manifest Jesus Christ. That's the Word of God in us to get us prepared for this marriage. Esther received the favor of the Chamberlain, just like we already read, because she pleased him in the works that she was doing in desiring the right things. Esther 2 and 15 says, And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken into King Ahasuerus, into his house royal in the tenth month, which is, which is the month to Beth in the seventh year, in the seventh year of his reign. Folks, we're in the seventh year now. We've already started the seventh year or the seventh thousandth year of his reign. And if you'll notice, Esther was one of many virgins. And if we go to Song of Solomon, she was one of many virgins, queens, and concubines. In Psalm 45, there were also the virgins who were not chosen to be the bride. That's the same way it is today in the church. Although we've all been sanctified and perfected at the cross, Romans 10 and 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And it's available to us when we walk by faith. Not all are going to be pleasing to the king's chamberlain. Being pleasing unto him is being pleasing to God because he is the spirit of God. Esther 2 and 17, the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained favor and kindness in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Well, Vashti represents the Lord's Old Testament bride. That's the one who was called to come into the presence of the king, but refused it. Just as she refused Jesus' invitation and was re rejected, reprobated, and hardened in heart. Esther 2 and 18. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast. And he made a release. That word release means rest, by the way. To the provinces and gave gifts. Well, the rest that the Lord promises to give us, which the Jews didn't enter into, is referred to in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. We enter into this rest by ceasing from our works and believing the promises of God. Hebrews 4 and 3, for we who have believed do enter into that rest. The Lord is offering us this wonderful rest. The rest from your enemies, the rest from all your problems, the rest from all the curses, etc., and etc. It's a rest because the Lord has already provided everything we need. And obviously for the bride, everything is provided too. Esther 2 and 18. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants and even Esther's feast. And he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the bounty of the king. There's never been a time like that last seven years of the marriage feast when God's going to hand out a bunch of great gifts. Never in history. He's going to be celebrating with the bride, just as John the Baptist said. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. The man-child Jesus was leading, teaching, and training the bride. And in this case, we know that Mordecai, and that name, Mordecai, means little boy or little man, was the man-child. He led Esther to this place to be chosen by the king. Esther 2 and 19, And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai was sitting in the king's gate. The king's gate was the place of government. <clears throat> That's the place where not only the leaders of the nations Underneath the conquering king represented their nations, but it was a place of judgment, judges, counselors, and on and on. And then 
<clears throat> Esther 2, or Esther 1 and 14, and the next unto him, the king, were Karshima, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Marys, Marcina, Mumakan, the seven promise, pro- princes of Persia and Media who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. The princes of these nations were before the, the king because they represented their nation. When he gave commands, they carried them out. You know who was over the kingdom of Israel? 2 and 21, and Esther 2 and 21. In those days, while Mordecai was sitting in the king's gate, folks, it was Mordecai. And the Jews were called the people of Mordecai. He had a position of authority in the kingdom. Yet a lot of people don't realize that. As a matter of fact, if you go back to the verse we read, we read there was a certain Jew in Shusham, the palace. Mordecai was in the palace because he represented God's people in Israel. Mordecai was the one who defended God's people, the one who had the bride intercede for God's people and the one who exercised authority over God's people. And when that authority was given to him, who? By the king. And we know that God gave authority to the beast to come against his people. But then he gave authority to Mordecai and to the bride to save them. Folks, that's an awesome story of God's power to save his people in these next days to come. And I believe it's coming soon, too. And it's an awesome story about what it takes to qualify to be in the bride. And it's important for you to know that you're not going to fly away just because you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. And you ain't going to be in the bride because of it. It's going to be because you have used the gifts that he has given us by the Holy Spirit. You don't need nothing but what the Holy Spirit has to offer. Nothing else. Nothing of man. Nothing of religion. So we need to read the New Testament diligently to find out what's been provided for us. Well, folks, I'm out of time. God bless you. And we'll see you again next week, God willing. For information, materials, and to contribute, go to unleavenedbreadministries.org. Contributions only may be addressed to David Eels, Post Office Box 231616, Montgomery, Alabama, 36123. Can quench my thirsting soul. Purest water made me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow, O oh, Jesus. I trust in you. Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For oh, your mercy stands and your word is true, O oh, Jesus. I trust in you. That darkest night What will be my guiding light The shining rays of red and white Jesus, I trust in you O sacred heart, in you I find Mercy seated for all time I am yours and you are mine O Jesus, I trust in you Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word is true, O Jesus, I trust in you. Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word is true, O Jesus. Jesus.